1918, Ninotna. The Black Death didn't get to Alaska until November. When it did, it cut down almost everyone in its path. The territorial governor imposed a quarantine and restricted travel into the interior, stationing U.S. marshals at all ports, trailheads, and river mouths to interdict travel between communities. He issued a special directive urging Alaska natives to stay at home and avoid public gatherings. Theaters closed, churches canceled services, schools were let out, but because of the inescapably communal nature of traditional life, natives were infected and died disproportionately. In Brevik Mission, only eight of 80 people survived. In some villages, there were no survivors at all. When the influenza pandemic passed late the following spring, those left alive were too weak to hunt for food, and even more died of starvation. In Ninotna, in March 1919, Chief Lev Kukesh and his wife Alexandra froze to death because they were too sick to get up and feed the fire in their wood stove. Four miles up the road at the Kanuyak Mine, mine manager Josiah Greenwood lost his wife and both sons, and one out of four of his workforce. Some of the uninfected turned to predation and thievery. Harold Halverson was beaten to death in a fight over his last bag of flour. Bertha Annalyn was assaulted in her own bedroom and died of her injuries two days later, alone in the bed in which she had been attacked. The offices of the Kanuyak mine were broken into a half dozen times, the cash box stolen, the glass case housing the cross of gold nugget shattered and the nugget gone, the company files rifled and set on fire. Toilets and refrigerators were ripped out of mine workers' homes as residents lay on their beds with no strength to resist. Food, clothes, photographs, personal papers, and jewelry vanished, most never to be recovered by their owners. Homes where entire families had died were left empty and abandoned. Village populations were halved. Cemeteries overran their boundaries. Eventually, inevitably, people rallied. In Ninotna, the memorial potlatch for Chief Lev and his wife was seen by many as a start down the road of recovery from an eight-month-long nightmare of disease and death. A time to mourn the dead, a time for the living to nourish their souls and rebuild their homes and towns. Moving forward was necessary for survival, even if they also understood that life would never be the same for any of them ever again. Organizing the potlatch fell to Chief Lev's only child, Elizaveta, age 17. Her life had nearly been forfeit, too, except that someone had come to their house, a man, a young placer miner, miraculously uninfected, who told her he had been checking house to house for anyone left alive. He found her in her bed, suspecting her parents were dead in the next room, but too weak to get up and find out. Like the rest of the survivors, she was thin and pale and grieving, but she was determined to do best by her tribe, by her parents, and by her chief. The girls from down at the Northern Light helped her wash and dress the bodies in their finest clothes. The young placer miner named Herbert Elmer Mac McCullough kindled a coal fire in the cemetery and used the heat to dig the graves in the still frozen ground. Some survivors weren't too sick to grumble, starting with the scandal of loose women helping to lay out tribal elders. Elizaveta had always been a wild child, they told each other, although much of that could be laid at Lev's door. He was the one who'd taught her to hunt and fish and trap in the first place, over the objections of his mother and her sisters and the rest of the elders. Theirs was a conservative and traditional tribe who thought a woman's place was in the home, sewing skins and making babies. Lev had even allowed Elizaveta to spend the previous summer working his gold claim in the Quilak foothills, and with Quinto Dementiev there too, chaperoned by her father, but still. That summer before the Black Death had been profitable for everyone. Lev had opened a bank account in Elizaveta's name. Alexandra was horrified, but Lev was adamant. She earned it, he told Alexandra, and handed the passbook to his daughter. Elizaveta was thrilled. She felt somehow a little taller with the passbook in her possession, and when she went to Knuyak to clean house for Angie Greenwood, she looked at the flush toilet she scrubbed out every week in a different way. No luxury was unattainable with your own money jingling in your pocket.
All that was changed now, of course. She had used all of her savings to buy gifts for the traditional gift-giving at her parents' potlatch. Tools, blankets, kitchenware, jewelry, canned food ordered in bulk from Sears Roebuck catalog. Then there was the expense of shipping it all to Cordova, from where, by special dispensation of Mr. Greenwood, it was brought in on the mine's railroad free of charge. Mr. Greenwood, a kind man, had always been punctilious about maintaining good relations with the people in Kanuyak, white and native, amateur and professional, and his own grief did not deter him now. When the day came, her parents' spirits had no cause for shame at what was given to family and friends in their name. No shame either in the hall of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, which she had decorated with pine boughs tied up with green and red ribbons. It gave the long, rectangular room a celebratory, albeit somewhat Christmassy air. Mac had helped her put them up the night before, followed by another delightful interlude of much mutual pleasure. <laughs>